on my mind. Hello and welcome to episode 35 of The Boxing Show with me, your host, Rob Tebbett. As always, I'd like to remind everybody to please like, comment and subscribe for more boxing content. Now that's out of the way, I'm joined by the usual twosome of Mr. Barry Jones and Mr. Andy Clark. Got a lot to get through today, guys, this past weekend, as well as this upcoming weekend for shows. How are we doing, everybody? Well? Good, yeah. Good. Barry? Good. Fantastic. Good stuff. Um, how's your weeks? How's your weeks been, Bar- uh, Andy? You were you were heavy waiting throughout the week, weren't you? You were you were yeah, what, 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 what were you, the uh, the day of reckoning and the ring of fire for you? So yeah. it sounds like quite an, <laughs> quite an interesting week. Yeah, it was good. It was good. You know that they um, we knew these announcements were coming, but I wasn't absolutely sure what Wednesdays would be. I had an idea, but I thought I may as well just wait until the day and get it all confirmed, get there early and rather than speculate because it was all quite top secret you know no one was really saying too much and yeah I mean the 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 23rd of December to put that together in the amount of time that they have is pretty it is pretty remarkable um and then just great to get the official announcement for Fury Usyk for February the 17th again we thought it would be the 17th or the 24th it's good to get it's good to get that in the in the diary and I'm not particularly nervous about it. I mean, somebody could get injured, I suppose. I mean, that can always happen, but I do feel like it's going to happen, that fight now. So it was, yeah, it was a good week. It was a good week. Um, Shout out to Fabio Wardley, who I worked with both days. I thought he was great. He was good fun and met you easy, you know, easy to work with. I don't know how much of that stuff he's done before, but but, um, yeah, he took to it really, really well. And just all around, Barry was there both days. I mean, you, you... saw the scale of it and um it was pretty impressive wasn't it yeah it was i <laughs> i was, no, just it, it, i felt it, the energy from him as soon as no, he went no, 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 fabio no, Fab, no, Fab was brilliant didn't he and lovely kid um no it was really good it was really good and it's good to see uh that's a really good bill i think everyone's got way excited over excited about it i think to be honest but i don't know it's, it's, no, it's a really good bill and the, I, what, what it's made a mockery of all these negotiations that boxing pro they talk about constantly in negotiations it's all Pollock's had it's all about it's just everything's more money bottom line because that they've just chucked money as a potential problem and look what look what they've done that's the truth of it look what, look what they've produced in, in, in really quick time we've got the two best heavyweights on the planet on paper <laughs> not on past but the recent performances aren't we but um it's um and that's happening in February you now and I think I'm with Andy I think I'm quietly confident that's going to happen and that bill you know we'll get all those heavyweights in the same ring on in the ring on the same night I know we're not getting well. We're not getting Wilder and Joshua actually fighting each other. This is the closest to it, and and so it's it's great news. Just as long as they can keep pumping the money in and keep it sustainable, I think then it's boxing doesn't lose. You can say, oh, they chuck a minute there. That's why it's going over there. But you can say that about Vegas. Vegas did that with their side fees. You know, rather than going to a stadium, you go in a tw- fifteen thousand pound, uh, fifteen thousand seat arena, because they're going to put 40, 40 million side fee. Or that's why all the fights are in London in the UK because they got a, they have a bigger a bigger pot a bigger pot to save us and we can put it on here because we can put it in a stadium or whatever it is. So you know that's always been the case. Just because it's in Saudi, it feels a bit different. But yeah, it's a good, there's this of that that December the twenty third bill. Though the date is awful, it, it really is awful. Like, yeah, it's just the worst date ever isn't it, for for working because you're coming back. Especially you have a family, it's the worst possible time, isn't it? You both be out there for that? I don't think I'm going to. I think I will be, yeah. yeah. You will. He's having a slag, isn't he? No, he's, a, he's a new slag. Now, I'm, I'm going to, I pretty much, just to let you know, I'm going to price myself out of it. Okay. One of those scenarios that I, I see, price, it's not the fortunes, but yeah, I'm going to do that. If 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 they are, if they are give me what I asked for, then I'd have to go. But otherwise, I'm, I, I'd rather stay with my family. Well, if His Excellency, Turkey Al Sheikh, is watching this, you never know, right. Barry, could be Christmas come early in the well, Jones household. He don't household. pay my wages, does he, ultimately? So it depends on, you know, ooh, there's a couple of people I work for and who will use me. But 
but I'll mention it. He might specifically watch this and go, I need this man. <laughs> yeah, of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I think it was a kind of a measure of the scale of everything. Obviously, I wasn't I wasn't there, but watched the the uh, the press conference. Just seeing like Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren and Jarrell Miller and Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua, just thinking like this really is insane. I kind of had this thought while I was out there thinking like, what if this is actually just kind of it now? This is this is what it's going to be for the next 20, 30 years. And, and my understanding is that is very much the plan from the Saudis in the Middle East that this will be the new norm. It will be a kind of, okay, we make these big, big shows. We make the big, big fights that people want. Whatever politics that we have to navigate, we will. And as is seen by Warren and Hearn et al all on the stage together. And it kind of made me think like, that could be really, really great. You know, like it just but it's something that didn't really kind of dawn on me until I saw it all happening on the stage. You know, it, it was thought, very, very surreal. The thought of never going to Vegas for a fight again makes me sad instantly. Makes I mean, me I'm sad. sure there will obviously be shows yeah. in Vegas. Um, but, no, but I mean, for us to go there though, that's the thing. It's, it's that's the, but it is what it is. You have to adapt it. And and the, but if they start putting on fights of, in other weight divisions as well, they might just be heavyweight crazy because it, it it has a, a wider audience big, and brings a bigger attention mm. to their for their needs. That, that's the interesting thing for me is is are, will they do that? Yeah, they've talked about. There's been some talk about Better Beer and Dimitri Bivol. Of course, Better Beer has to get past uh, Callum Smith first in, in January. But there's talk of that potentially at some point happening in Saudi Arabia as well. But we wait with bated breath. But one thing's for sure: it's very very interesting, and there's been a sizable shift in the landscape. Day of reckoning and ring of fire sounds like ring my, of fire. Uh, before it, and after my uh, fight night pizzas is, is it, anyway, isn't ring um, of fire when the baby comes out of the I don't know but anyway let's move on we've got a lot to get through today that. let's you move on let's move back uh, to Shakur Stevenson who this Thursday night Andy returned to the ring against a very dangerous man in Edwin De Los Santos and he was treated as such very dangerous indeed in, to the point where we didn't see vintage Shakur Stevenson far from it this past weekend and it's a fight where albeit a win and now a three-weight world champion, the WBC lightweight champion, kind of emerges from it. It feels like his stock has gone down a little bit on the base, basis of that performance. Is that harsh or is that, that kind of fair? I think it probably has. I, I don't know whether it's necessarily fair, but expectations with him have always been high and, and some of his fights earlier in his career, again, people maybe expected more. They expected more fireworks. They expected that when somebody's got that kind of profile that they need to be more of a crowd pleaser but but essentially it is about winning I think he did have a problem with his left hand that's what he said subsequently and I know that fighters often say that off the back of a, a lacklustre display but it may well be true uh, in which case that that does explain quite a lot but he is judged quite harshly Stevenson and, and I think all fighters in that kind of bracket that's just the territory that that's the that's the air you breathe that, and you just have to accept it. But he is a three-weight world champion now. Um, what it might do is make some of those fights that we would like to see possibly slightly more probable because people might look at that and just think, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll fight him off the back of that performance. They, they might fancy it a bit more. That sometimes happens, doesn't it? But it wasn't a great watch, was it? To be to be perfectly honest, no, it certainly wasn't. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of uh, his Nakatila fight down at Super Featherweight, where he kind of, by his own admission, he said he felt the power early on and, and, and navigated the rest of the fight. Yeah, um, Barry, it, it was like that actually. Yeah, I covered yeah. that fight, and and it was difficult to find any fault with him that night because it, young though he is, he's a pragmatist, isn't he? You know, he understands that it is about it is about winning. We talked about it before, haven't we? This generation of fighters who come through with with Mayweather is there as their guy basically as as how you go about doing things and he was he was you know supersonic fighter obviously but particularly when he got to that stage of his career where he was really making the money he was he was an arch pragmatist it was hit and don't get hit it was you know he wasn't bothered about fireworks he he managed to make himself a, a massive attraction without actually providing that which was which was kind of his genius really i suppose Harry, we're, we've all kind of spoken about Shakur Stevenson in the past. I think it's all fair to say we, we're, we're fans, certainly, of his skill set in the ring. Do you think that this past weekend was a, was an opportunity missed to really kind of put his foot down as, as one of the, the top guys at lightweight? Or do you think it's all about the win and, and he's now a three-weight world champion? Yeah, I think, well, ultimately, so it is always about the win. Mm. It is about, but yeah, we judge him at a higher level. And he is, but he is brilliant. And you can see that in, in his the way he's always thinking about stuff. But I think the difference sometimes between... Um, 
taking that leap from being a potential superstar to the superstar is educate your risks. You don't see sh no fighter on in history has had every fight being a stellar performance. That's impossible to happen. But you don't see like a Ray Leonard not commit to an attack in a fight like that. That's that I would say. No, De Santos was quite negative, and he sat in the back foot, and he was dangerous, and I understand that. And he, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't, but he wouldn't engage with Stevenson. But Stevenson was only one willing to throw combination on on top of another combination. And that's what he needed to do to break Dos Santos down because the, he knew something was coming back, which means he's he's intelligent enough to know that, and he's clever enough to know that. But it's his job to navigate that and still get the job done, which I suppose he did, but not as not as impressive as we would like. So he's gonna get criticism for it, and he's gonna. You no, know, that was a. I suppose it was a little bit of a platform thing to say. I'm in this division now, and all you guys better start running away. But um, yeah, it wasn't really stellar. But it's, he's still brilliant, and I, and I still think he's, he is the guy who's gonna maybe drag us into a new era. But he needs to know there's a point in that fight where he where he had to go. I just gotta commit here now because I'm good enough I'm fast enough and my feet are good enough I can think I can react quick if he if he does something and he played a little bit too safe that was pretty much all he did but he, but he went at the canter does the performance change how you see him does it particularly yeah. up at lightweight now of course he's come no. from featherweight the, the shots are going to be heavier if he goes to lightweight and 140 of course does it change how you see him and the potential future that he has at no, all? I don't think so I think you know I think we talked about Mayweather that's all that's the reason why he adapted because they were bigger he couldn't be an, an intimidating figure an imposing figure so he had to he had to adapt his style to be a more safety first fighter but still dominating almost every contest he ever had so <laughs> can pick holes in that but like Andy said he sold himself on his life outside of the ring and I don't think um, Stevenson can do that or should do that I would say no I think he can be I think he'd be more excited at this way I don't think this weight is the limit where he goes to hit too hard for me I think that's super lightweight because he, he will go there inevitably I think and that'll be the weight where he's going to have to be more cut um yeah, constantly cautious in every fight. But this, but this, like I think, lightweight now is a, is a, is a division where he can be is most exciting. I think because he has fighters there who are going to force good stuff out of him. De Santos wasn't that, but he, but also he should blow through fighters like De Santos if we think he's going to be where he's where he is going to end up. I feel as a guy, we as a generational talent, which is a new phrase that we all talk about. But I think he is he is that, and he will be that. But if you just if that's the first time you saw him, you just you wouldn't see it. But he boxed well. I, he, he, do, he does but, need a big fight though, doesn't he? I think because mm. has he have all the titles he's won been vacant titles. He won a title off uh, Oscar Valdez. That's right. That Valdez that's held right. in unification, but he won a vacant featherweight and super no super featherweight. He won it off Jamal uh, Jamal Herring. Yes, with Jamal Herring yes. has the super featherweight. He won the vacant uh, 126 against Drake Gonzalez. But with weight hopping now, I think that's just the norm, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. people don't stay at the weight for, for more than one fight now, cause, or two fights, because they go, no, my next, my next challenge has to be, and every every kid who turns pro, like, I want to be a multi weight world champion. Mm. Oh, you know, you're gonna grow. You might hmm. be stuck at that. You know, that doesn't. I mean, being a three weight world champion, or being a, or being a dominant champion with your weight, Golovkin, for instance. I know he won super. To middle, but really, to a middleweight career, middleweight. Mm. His career stands up against anyone else's almost around his era. He stayed in that division. He dominated massively. There was no huge names around. Look at Hagler. He's done. He dominated his division for a long time. And and so when you talk about who's the greatest, so uh, you call who's the greatest super lightweight of all time. And you no, know, in fifty hundred years, you'll 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 be stopping at nineteen ninety four. Because you're gonna go like everyone else didn't stay there long enough to, mm. to, to, to we have with super featherweights now who's the, the greatest super featherweight of all time you go it's hard to tell because a lot of them jumped because that was that was almost like a stepping stone to go go somewhere else mm. and then yeah so I think you know dominating your division is not a bad thing but all this I think you being a multi world champion doesn't mean doesn't make you automatically a better fighter and in, certainly in this era because of that everyone's everyone's boxing with vacant titles. Which is the best way to win a title, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, it is a good point, though. I mean, particularly now, it's one of the reasons why I asked the question about making the statement at lightweight, because we've seen the very public negotiations back and forth with Devin Haney, the undisputed champion. Javante Davis has kind of had his 
bits and pieces with Shakur Stevenson. It, it seems to me like that was an opportunity for him. There was the F1 in Vegas and he was headlining. They were trying to make, you know, a big deal about that. To produce, it's not just not producing your best, but I mean, we've seen videos of people leaving the arena and all of that stuff. It seems as though that felt like something of an opportunity missed. But anyway, we do have to move on because we do have a lot to get through. Uh, final one from that Thursday night card. We saw a majority draw in the Emmanuel Navarrete Robson Conce Sal fight uh, for the WBO Super Featherweight title. Rob Robson Conce Sal, Andy, it's kind of a very much a nearly man now. That's third time unlucky for him in challenging for a world title. In a fight which, despite being dropped twice, he gave a very, very good account of himself, and many people felt that he may have been slightly unfortunate not to get it. Yeah, I think he was slightly unfortunate. I, I think it was one of those fights where whoever didn't get it would feel like they were unlucky. Mm. Um, Conce Sao, I, I wasn't convinced that he would be that good a pro, to be honest. I saw him quite a lot as an amateur and, and I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't really buy him, I don't think. But yeah, he's proved me, he's proved me wrong. And he has been unlucky. He has been unlucky. He's due, he's due, basically. And I would like to see him get over the line for that reason, because he took it well. And he's taken it well in the past. And that's, that's not an easy thing to do. So, yeah, I, I would be I would be keen to see him get the rub of the green, but I wouldn't say it was close. It was really it was tight. It was really really tight, and I didn't think it was some kind of um, travesty that, that he didn't get the decision. He, he could have though, mm. um, I, but again, he didn't. And I think that that for me is why I feel sympathy for him because this has happened a few times now. Obviously, a, a brilliant amateur that he was. He had that fight with Lewis Correa. Do you remember a couple of fights for yeah. Oscar Valdez? We got dropped and got docked two points and squeaked by by a decision. I think everybody, myself included, thought, okay, well, it's obviously not trans lazy. It hasn't translated from the amateurs into the pros. And then I thought it was very unfortunate against Oscar Valdez in a fight where Oscar Valdez failed a drugs test in the yeah. build up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he does feel like he's due one. Um, for Emmanuel Navarrete, Barry, it's a name that we've mentioned a fair few times on here recently due to Joe Cordina and, of course, Lee Wood. He kind of has this, he looked sensational against Oscar Valdez. He, he didn't look great at all against Liam <coughs> Wilson. He kind of has those those good and bad nights. And I felt like this past weekend or, or Thursday just gone was, was somewhere in the middle for him. We saw flashes of what he's capable of, but also where he can be outboxed. I thought this performance was what I thought we were going to see it, uh, of him at, at Super Feather. Because I just thought his, you know, his power and his size at, at Super Panther and Feather with what's got his work rate of course what got him through I thought when he steps at the waist it's not, he's not going to be as, as, as imposing but um, he's proved me sort of wrong really but in, that, in, in the fight against Constant Sato he wasn't as busy you know, the punches didn't carry the same weight that he got knocked on but I mean not the same I, he wasn't Robson's Constant Sato was never really worried about committing to his attacks so it, yeah if Constant Sato turns the hands over it turns that right hand over he hits with the fingers too often He's lovely smooth. He's got a lovely rhythm to his work. Nice and smooth. But he hits with the fingers. He can punch. He can. If he turns a hand over, yeah, he's he's not only he not only wins the world title. They all avoid him. I think he'd be half avoided now. I think he's a, no, he's a, he's a world he's, a, he's world championship quality, without a doubt. I think. I think he's brilliant. Really liked him. And I thought he was unlucky. Not massively on the screamer because you know he got knocked down twice and never he did sort of you know, try to finish strong. But I, I thought Constance box really well. Really well, even when he got knocked down. I know the second knockdown wasn't really that heavy, I don't no. think. But um, sort of bundled him, a yeah. Bit, yeah. But yeah, but it's, it was a weird shot, wasn't it? It was like a, a half a sort of like yeah, to a body shot, but yeah. But it's like on the as he's moving back into it. It was mm. a weird, it, it didn't look. I, I surprised he didn't complain about it, but he doesn't complain about much, does he? No. Yeah, but never, <laughs> yeah. But to be honest, it's been you know, we'll see, we'll see what um. Well, Garcia's like no this weekend because the the, the only other super featherweight really in our little mix not to fight yet. You know, they all they've all boxed close to each other, haven't they? Because none of them have looked outstanding. Mm. I've got to be honest. Shaky Foster it was a really it was a really fantastic uh, win. You know, but he's struggling in that fight. Cordina didn't look fantastic against Vasquez, a nasty smaller guy. Navarrete struggled. Probably probably at the hardest opponent of, out of everyone I would have thought in, in Constance Albi still struggled and just squeaked over the line. And we'll see, we'll see how, um, how Garcia gets on Saturday. And if he, if he can, you know, maybe he stakes his claim as being the best super featherweight if he puts on a, a really good performance. But he got a difficult night as well. So, 
yeah, it, it leaves you wide open, I think. No. If you're Joe Cordina, you're looking at that fight against Emmanuel Navarrete, though, and you're licking your lips after this past weekend, or do you think it's still tempering expectations? Because as you mentioned there, Joe wasn't fantastic in his last fight. I think Joe Cordina should move up a weight. Like, I thought, I thought before, he, I, I, when he went on the Super Featherweight, I thought oh, he's never going to make that weight. And he did, and he looked fantastic. But he's too big, too big for the weight. And I think that was evident against Vasquez, I think. I, I think, yeah. I, I, I know he had to dig it out, but I just think he's. Um, I, th I thought he was a bit lethargic and, and didn't have the same sort of s spite to his work. So yeah, but but if he stays a super feather, yeah, then he then you know he wouldn't he wouldn't be scared of fighting boxing any of them. The problem is they're all on the other side of the street now, aren't they? Foster just signed with top rank. <laughs> Navarrete is with top rank. Yeah, and look, um, with Garcia's PVC. with PVC, but where they're going now, who knows? Yeah, so he's sort of the. Um, in no man's land the minute Cordina well he's not in no man's land he's got a really fantastic fight domestic fight with Lee Wood haven't he that's the that's the mini fight for him mm. if you would have thought so yeah he goes that route but yeah he, he, he would have watched that and fancied his chances against either one of them I think Constance Hall on that showing is a harder fight than Navarrete for, for Cordina on that showing but who knows but Constance Hall's a good fighter I think Navarrete's had the hard out of, out of those three champions who box he's had by far the harder the harder test had the defence, so you know he got he, he just beat a really good fighter. So that's a good result. Mm. Somebody who's genuinely proven as an amateur and as a pro, Robson and, and, and I think he win a world title, Constant, So I do. Okay, moving on to Saturday night's uh, segment of the show. It's going to be a long one. I don't really know <laughs> where to start, Andy. Uh, but we will start in Wolverhampton uh, with Adam Azim, who is now, of course, the European Super Lightweight Champion. Thought he boxed very well against Frank Pettijon en route to a 10th round stoppage win in a performance where I thought he showed quite a bit of maturity. Yeah, I liked him. I thought I thought it was a good performance. And just 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 quickly on on the whole weekend, I know we're going to get into the bones of it. I just thought it was a great weekend. Yeah. Really good couple of cards. Frank's show in, in Manchester, in, in terms of strength and depth, was 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 the better of the two cards. You would have to say, uh, but I thought they were both good, um, well attended, some great fights, and and I just really buzzed off it. You know, not just the Sky Show that I was working on myself, but seeing what was happening in Manchester too. I thought it was it was terrific, you know, good matches, had some upsets, some great stories. It was great, you know, and it's exactly what we need at the minute because there's there's quite a lot of doom mongering around and there's quite a lot of arguing and, you know, it's all got a bit irritating, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, and weekends like last weekend, they're, they're what we need. Um, and Azim, yeah, I, th I thought Petajon, you could watch it and as I was watching it and think to yourself, well, this is a bit grim isn't it you know he's not really showing a lot he's he's not really trying to win but I think it was quite simple he when he did try and do anything he got hit by Azeem uh, and it hurt and he was just trying to stay in there hoping something would change he was coping was what he was doing he was never really in the fight he got stuck down by the body shot um, got up from that and kept going and then it just got to the point where he just couldn't really take it anymore to be honest and I thought Azim did well because in a fight like that, if you don't get the stoppage and you're him, then people will complain because he's already in that place where people expect him to stop people and he'd had two uh, distant fights in a row. And even though it's for a European title, you know, people will be quick to say, well, you're trying to sell this guy as the next big thing. And this is three times in a row now that he's not been able to break somebody down. And secondly, somebody I've never even heard of so he did need to, to force it um, and he chipped away and chipped away uh, and just eventually broke him and yeah I liked it it was good it was good I thought it was a good performance Barry your thoughts on Adam Azim's performance yeah I echo sort of Andy's sentiments really yeah he probably boxed well I think um, now we're at the point where we're going to see about his IQ he hasn't really shown that yet his physical attributes are fantastic his fast hands he has power and he used that he used his size and his strength and he sort of bullied the guy who was quite negative or wasn't allowed to be very offensive because every time he threw a shot as he put him in his place really quickly and he dominated the centre of the ring he pushed him back with you no know, with controlled aggression it was all that was good it just I thought you could have maybe <laughs> to find a negative and a positive <laughs> <laughs> yes um, 
he could have a little bit more variety in some of his stuff to, to break him down I think a little bit I think he was a little bit walking him down which is the right thing to do but he could have moved a little bit changed the angles a bit through different shots that's all, that's all I can pick out of it to be honest I think he's good he's going to get criticised he's not blasting people out there like, as, like you sort of alluded to that there didn't you he's not, not, not putting people to sleep because no one knows who the guy is but that's a, that's a seasoned campaigner he's a, he's, a, he's a young boy I think it's a good test and, and it's at European level and he's got there very very quickly but I think he's just going where his talents are taking him I can I say uh, I, organically I was the word I like to use recently but yeah but and I think it is so where'd he go I think you know we we, we can't we cool down a little bit on boxing for world titles next week but you know this is a good level for him to stay after a little while I, I would say a couple more fights at this level some good fights out there for him good fights domestically if they want to be made and then we'll see where he's at who are all the European level Dalton Smith is the first is a prime example Harlem Eubanks another example they, they, those guys are both you know, easily European level better than the guy he just beat for the European title but domestic so they're great fights to be made they'll never happen because they're all on different platforms but it's no, but they're the sort of fights that they should be calling out I think and they sort of did didn't they yeah, I, yeah. I think um, Ben Shalom sort of called either well, Harlem I think he called Harlem out more than yeah Dalton Smith's been yeah. sort of banging the drum on the matchroom side of things Harlem Eubank obviously yeah. came back with a good win on Channel 5 which is uh, and on a show that was viewed by a lot of people yeah, uh, did good, very very well I think it's shows. all to do with great Mr. Work, Barry great Jones great with Channel 5 like, since I've been there this viewers have gone through the, through the roof <laughs> it's, not, it's not wearing underpants to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't want to see he what's, like he you don't want to see what's going on underneath yeah, but, but, but again, that was you know they, you, there's a bit of a theme emerging there because they they, they took the show to Brighton, which mm. hasn't had boxing for mm. quite a long time, as far as I'm aware. But that's where he's from, and a couple of mm. thousand they sold it out. Great atmosphere, looked great. Yeah. Wolverhampton, three and a half, three three and a half thousand haven't had boxing there for for quite a while. I think um, I did the show. Sorry, I think I did the show there for Box Nation. Frankie Gavin Frank Leonard Bundu. Oh, what a fuck. I worked that on that. Was, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was there for that. Yeah, they're brilliant. Yeah, Again, it was me. And, it, and when, when, when I knew we were going back there, I just thought, brilliant. This is a really, really good great, venue. Yeah, really venue. good venue. You know, Bournemouth with Billum Smith towards the end of the year. Just taking it to places where, you, I know the, the Bournemouth's been a, a regular spot for Chris. But, but it wasn't. But it until, wasn't. Yeah. It just, it's, it's you know, that's it, it's better than half empty it's big like arenas. The, it's like the 90s, isn't it? That's what yeah, Sky used to go. It's better than, than half got, empty it's big arenas. It's great around the places, yeah. And follow, you'd follow the fighter, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like boxing itself, isn't it? Just keep it simple. Do the basics. Do the basics right. Everybody's up here trying to throw a Superman punch and a pivot this and a twist around there. Just get behind the jab. Get to some <laughs> Take get shows to, some to, shows to, and to some places where there's a yeah. real appetite for it. And then when you've got something big, then go to the O2 or the Manchester Arena depends, or, or depends, whatever. Yeah, I think because it, it is you, you, it's supply and demand, isn't it? You know, if you if you could say oh, I could sold three, I could I could have sold a hundred more tickets. But you know, then you find the bigger venue for the next one. It's rather especially for the atmos atmosphere. The promoters will go. We just want we just we we'll go to a bigger venue and get more people in. Even if it's even if it's half empty, we make more money. Maybe, maybe that's how it works. But. I presume that is how it works <laughs> but, um, but if you're a TV promoter and you're getting that TV money and the shows no, none of these shows were getting paid none of, none of these fighters on these shows Saturday were getting paid fortunes I don't <laughs> think they're all good money I'm, I'm sure they are but none of them are, no, you're not breaking the bank for anyone I wouldn't have thought so it's like why not put them in a more intimate venue uh, to, the, to the scale you're at I think you know, again, and it helps the fighters pr produce better fights no, Tyler Denny there. If, he, if he's boxing, if he's boxing a massive empty arena, actually, it's a bad choice because he, he 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 fights the same way wherever he is. But you know, but having that crowd cheer you on, especially at home, mm. you never know. You got buzzed in the fight. Yeah, exactly. You know you know I mean, he, he fires through. You know, it, it can it can help you. We've seen him, look at Nathan Heaney. I don't know, we are not on that build yet because he brings an audience with him. It's that sort of snap. That that crowd they help you in those tough moments. They help you push you through. And so in an intimate venue, yeah, you know, it, it's it's nothing wrong with going to and all those and Sky and BT and the zone, they've got enough money to make a ledge centre look like a Caesar's palace. Yeah. To be fair, they can make it look that they can make it look fantastic. And also, yeah. And and it'd be I'm sure it'd be cost effective for everyone. And again, just doing kind of like sensible things like okay, the the, the show is is kind of pushed as being a zine because Sky are giving a zine the big push. But then he was on last because he sold the most tickets and you want all of them to stay all the way through. And he got in the ring. The first bell went. I looked at my watch at 10 o'clock. So Azim was in the ring at like quarter past nine or nine o'clock. And then he was in at 10 o'clock. 
And these are things that boxing yeah. fans have been saying repeatedly on social media for a really long time. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, watching Danny win, I know I'm kind of jumping ahead, but it was, it's just a great story. You know, yeah, you could is. see how much it meant to him. He was really confident during the week. I was just slightly worried that maybe he was a bit too confident, but he did absolutely what he needed to do. A uh, little, little bit strange the way it, it finished. I think the Italian corner were quite kind of despondent with the, how the whole thing had gone and they felt that, you know, that he was a dirty fighter, basically. And, and head clashes can be a feature of his fights, but he gets low and he stays low. And, and the head clash, you couldn't really argue that there was anything deliberate about it. And he was up on the cards anyway. I think he lost that fifth when he got clipped. But other than that, you know, he was he was clearly winning the fight. And it's just great scenes, you know. And that, that's what you love to see when you're working on fights. You love to see the joy when someone just realises that dream that they've been working for for so long. And particularly when it's something they probably didn't think would happen. You know, he won his English title at the third attempt. With Azeem, it's different because we feel like he's going to go on and achieve a lot. We don't know yet. Nothing is guaranteed ever. But when, when you see someone like Denny win that European or Heaney get that British and you know you know kind of what it's all been about for them, it's just, that, that's what's great about sport. That, that's what's great about sport. And I just think we had just had a brilliant weekend um, in, in that regard. Scarf beating Esselman, you know, just, just so many things. But the journeys, like Denny and Azim on the same show, the journeys, that, the, their journeys are just... Polar opposite. Yeah. Well, it's, just, it's, like, it's like Premiership football and, and Conference League, isn't it? You know, you're not giving Denny any chance. He's having, I, I like Denny because it's, it's a totally different career to mine, but it's, I can understand that because like, unless you were a big name, Always, and then people don't see it. We don't really see other the TV fighters, but you're not always a TV fighter. Even though I was undefeated, I had, I, I was the away fighter boxing people undefeated to get to get to get to a place to, to get to 13 and 0 or 12 and 0, so someone bigger would hopefully take notice of you. And he's had to do that, but he's had a few losses on the way. But he just keeps, you know, he's, and and, you, and you're the, the away fighter. Don't mean you're the you're the worst fighter there. It just means you, you know they either fancy the other guy or you don't sell tickets. Whatever whatever it is, you have to you know, you 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 have to take that bigger risk, shorter notice, no than the other guy and things like that. And that's so and and that's how it, it happens quite often in sport. That we don't really see too often. And it's a great story. So you so you see that and you go, it's not Adam Azim who's having everything his own way. It's, but, but but with added pressure that most people can't cope with, that's another thing. We don't give, we don't understand that as well either. The all that pressure he's got to, to to achieve to succeed is sort of like we take it for granted. But that's that's a for a young man on your put on that weight on your shoulders can be immense. But he's having all the fights you know when he wants them against the, they're picking the right opponents and Tyler Den is going the other way begging for fights, losing money, or maybe if he's, had, if he's on ticket deals early on in his career, or, or you know your opponent's getting more than you, be a boxer at home, that's what happened to me. You know, and, and you're, you've had to take undefeated kids very early in your career, otherwise you're not going to get a fight. And that's where you go, you have to travel late notice to go and box an undefeated kid, and, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's difficult, but it, it builds you and forms you as a character. And, and, and steals you for in bigger fights, then you don't panic. And you see that with Tyler Denny. He treats every fight the same. He do, I mean, he's as nervous, he's, he looks nervous, but he doesn't get any more nervous in the European title fight than he did in an English title fight. Because he's always, he's a, he is the natural underdog. It's a great story. He is the more, he's more of the boxing story than, than, you, than if you see some guy go from the Olympic medal to being a multi-world champion. His story is more boxing than, than any other. Yeah, I don't think you can really... You he can, is you, boxing. But you, you, <laughs> but you can really get behind that and kind of capture people's imagination with it. And... and and you know make something of it i really you know i really do think that and and that's wh when you're in a period where that big joshua boom of 2017 18 stadium fights and it's it extended longer than that and we had hey bell you around that period as well and and you know there were massive pay-per-views you know that's that's over for, for the moment um but everything goes in cycles that's normal something like that's never going to persist forever and when you're in these kind of interim periods where you're trying to build fighters and 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 bring the next the next generation, if you ever get another one like like AJ through, you have to be a bit creative, don't you? And and people emerge who you look at and you think, well, we never really expected we might be able to do something with him. I'm not saying Tyler Denny's going to be a pay per view fighter necessarily, but one of the first things I, I did on Sunday morning when I saw that Heaney had won um, was just say Tyler Denny, Nathan Heaney is a domestic mega fight. And I know that sounds a bit 
of a mad thing to say, but it is because of their fan bases for the European and British titles, those two. If that could happen, there's other people who have plenty to say about that because Hamza Shiraz is supposed to fight no, Heaney now and Kieran Conway won the final eliminator. But I just looked at that and just thought, imagine that like with, with, with their stories and their fan bases. Imagine what you could do with that. You know, and Barry's right. That is like, they, these are the real boxing stories that I think people can, it's the underdog Rocky thing that everybody loves that you can, you can really invest in it if you, if you get behind it. Yeah, I mean, everybody loves a poster boy and everybody kind of will have their own stories about, you know, when Anthony Joshua came through, but it sometimes is those fights and those stories that can kind of grab you as a young boxing fan. See, like how Anthony Crawler kind of came through and was a world champion. If people would have thought that when Anthony Crawler early on in his career was no losing for an English title, then everybody would have been like, nah, it's not going to be him. He, he Tyler Denny could be that person. Could be. Yeah, I... I th- I'm I'm shocked he's got to this level. I'm over the moon for him. I'm I can't like just European champion. It's like you don't see it. Even when you watch him, you don't see it. Doesn't see, he doesn't seem he has the skill set to be a European champion, but he is because he has those others the other ingredients. Crawler was a quite a Crawler changed. Joe Gallagher. If any any trainers deserve credit for making a fight a, a boxer a better fighter, it was Joe Gallagher with Anthony Crawler. He was just he was bordering on domestic level and you call it that's where he was at which is fantastic by the way people forget if you're not world, if you're not world level you're shit being a British champion is, is like well, look, look at Nathan Healy I was going to mention that later in, on in but, the, it mean, yeah, but it means everything to any fighter who wins it by the way and if that's your level because most boxers don't have an aspiration to be a world champion you're just, you're just winging it you're just going as far as it'll take you and that's the beauty of it as well by the way that with Denny's and people like that because they just going as far because they didn't turn pro with any massive aspirations no, other people didn't have didn't have hopes for him. They had they had their own little private hopes, but they're just dreams, really. So you just you every fight, it's just well, I'll just keep going, keep rolling the dice and see where I end up. But what it shows is if you invest in the sport, not the person, you have good nights like Saturday. I think that I think that's clear to see. You do invest in the fighters once once they become good, like good fighters, but every fighter, you no, know, from Davis to Ball to he, to Heaney. You know, it's, it's only Adam and Zine, they're really, they're, 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 who they push from day one. He's the only fight that I, I really, Saturday, who's really stood out, who they really invested in as a superstar from early in his career. The rest of them, as good as they are, have had to do their, had to do their learning fights pretty much in the shadows. But it, so we're investing in good, so it, the Saturday shows, investing in good fights give us a great night. Like, I, like I'm not an intelligent man. And I'm certainly not a promoter, but that, that invest in the sport. Because then when, when the pay-per-view fight that falls off the planet, you know, or, or retires, whatever it is, the sport's still in a healthy position. You'll find superstars and pay-per-view stars within that, within that, if you just do that. Because unexpected things happen, don't they? People emerge who you're not really expecting. And you, you, the, the classic example is always Frotch Groves. And, and yes, that's a world title fight, and, and Frotch was a massive name, but no one thought what would happen in that first fight would happen. It was and a mismatch you, on paper. And then thing. you look at what happened Everything, off the back of it. Yeah. Strange things can happen. And, and, and then you look at the way that fighters kind of invest in themselves. And I remember seeing Heaney box on a Queensbury bill in Telford in June 2021, I think it was. And yeah, he got a win. He didn't look great. Uh, Dubois was, was, was on that card. It was his first fight back since, he lost, to, since he lost to Joyce. Yeah. And, you know, after the, after the show... Um, me and the, the rest of the talk sport team just went to this pub basically across the road and a load of Heaney fans went there as well and, and not that long afterwards he's in there with his wraps still on pretty much still in his kit because he's just been around all the coaches who've come up to watch him in the coaches saying hello to people shaking hands comes to the pub to shake hands with all the people who've come to see him Did, does he really want to be there at that point given that he's boxed no he doesn't but you, but you wouldn't have known that he didn't and that's that's the kind of stuff that people don't see sometimes it's it's hard graft building up a massive fan base. People just think it, oh, you're lucky you sell tickets. It's not, there's no, there's no luck involved in it. It's a lot of hard work. Um, so those kinds of fighters who, who do all that work for the promoter, if you like, that they deserve what they get. It was a fantastic evening of boxing. It's something that we've all kind of had our, our, our moans over over the course of the last year, but particularly over the last year. I think we, we spoke about it on a couple of pods ago. It's not been the strongest year on these aisles for, for boxing. We haven't had 
those big stadium fights that we've spoken about in recent times. We haven't had, you know, uh, a huge influx of big pay-per-views in the UK. Um, but it shows what happens. You know, I feel like at times we've sanitized the sport and you kind of rid it f- from all of the potential of all of these amazing things to happen when you see a 25 to one on shot, a 50 to one on shot, a 16 to one on shot every time. You just look down one side of the card and you just know before watching it what's going to happen. Yeah, okay, you get the occasional upset because boxing is boxing. But just a few fights on the card, I mean, obviously the Warren card, I mean, both cards were good. But the Warren card was very, very deep, as you mentioned. It just shows you having those few opportunities for a bit of chaos i suppose yeah because boxing has that potential to give you that it can give you it if you just give it that opportunity but if everybody is super safe and super sanitized and don't want to occasionally we might do this we might do that that's fine as long as you know what comes from it is a big story and everything that kind of goes with it so i think saturday was it was kind of one of those rare feelings where i wake up on the sunday morning obviously tired from from the night before but still you wake up and you're you're buzzing and there's things to talk about this i mean like today's a good example a message this morning we're, today we're going to talk about this 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 oh god there's a lot to talk about mm. rather than oh yeah the 50 to 1 on favorite one and you know that and that's it really we have to kind of jazz it up <laughs> there was yeah. no need for that and no, it no. wasn't something that really required yeah. bells and whistles or, or anything out of the ordinary it required well-matched fights and decent stories yeah, and, and, you know, title fights. The, the British title is a, the, just a mega, mega title because... I thought I loved, it, sorry, I loved how Heaney re- described it as the FA Cup of boxing. I thought yeah, that was Yeah, it, it just, it, it produces big, it produces really, really good fights because it means so much to the fighters that win it. And you look at that fight with, with, with Bentley and, and Heaney. Denzel's had that title for a, for a good while now. He's, he's won enough British title fights to have won it outright, but he hasn't because there hasn't been a mandatory in there. He stepped up and boxed Janibek, did a lot better than a lot of people thought he would. And I'd imagine he was probably a bit frustrated to still be defending that British, maybe, because everybody wanted Signani and, and Boxer managed to get him for, for Tyler Denny. But if you just drop your concentration or desire level or fear level, even just by 1%, 2% in a British title fight, and you've got someone really, really hungry for whom this is their FA Cup final, which is what it was for Heaney, then then you can lose. And on paper, Bentley is clearly a better fighter than Nathan Heaney, I would say. And I, I mean, no disrespect to Nathan when I say that. But on Saturday, Heaney beats him. And that's what you get. You know, that's what you get because... You've got a target on your back when you've got that British title, and it's a big target and target, and you've got loads of people wanting to have a crack at it. And Nate Collins, Zach Miller, by the sound of it, was a really good fight really good as well. Fight, yeah, really good, good fight. And you look at actually. Esselman again, like a, a long reigning British champion, has won it outright. And again, you just find yourself up against someone in Scarf who's had a few opportunities, he's had some near misses, but he's just kept going. And he got his chance on Saturday and he did the business. Yeah, we, we've jumped across and around have, and back and have. forth, but that's fine. It's, again, a measure of kind of how many things that we've got to talk about, and it's exciting. Um, I'm going to dial it back to the Sky card on Saturday night. Barry, going to come to you first. As I understand it, we saw him in the ring afterwards. Enoch Paulson will be next for Adam Azim, but, you know, for the for the dreamers out there, let's um mm-hmm. let, let's have a look at what potentially could follow after that. Which fight would you like to see for Adam Azim? Is it Dalton Smith? Is it Harlem Eubank? Who do you want? Yeah, I'd like to see Harlem Eubank, actually. Because uh, Harlem, yeah, Harlem Ewan has become a really good all round boxer. I think I think his movement's really good. He, he, it's movement with thought. It's not just moving for the sake of moving, just trying to avoid you. Or he's actually trying to find the right angle to so he can attack. He's in a safe place all the time. And he's 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 based himself around the Sugar Ray Leonard image, but it works for him. He flurries as well. I think he's starting to sit down and shots a little bit more as well. As well. So, and he's maturing. You can feel that. So I think he's a real test for Azim. I think you'd make Azim a favourite again. I would. I would. I would think because he just looks really strong and fast, and he's big for the weight. Like he looks big, even though he's moving up. He doesn't look any smaller. Like it's just his back's getting big. He's not much in the front, but it's, it's like he's got like, like frame, uh, yeah. monsters on his back or something. He's just getting bigger, like like a werewolf, isn't he? And um, I should call him the werewolf now. But um, yeah, it, it's just, his back's just massive, and 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 yeah, you can see he carries the power. Just needs to let his hands go a little bit more, I think, as he. But yeah, I, that's a great fight, and and it's a little bit, it's a great name. Eubank is always a great name. I don't know where it goes, but 
yeah, it's a good fight. And as is Dalton Smith. But Dalton Smith's a really tricky night. A trickier night for him, I would say. So it's, it's difficult. Yeah, but this, he defends the European title now. It's not, it's, not, it's not a gimme, but I think it's a fight. It's a winnable fight for him. And But I think they, no, they're going to have to be... They'll be chasing him now. I think that's what it's going to look like, I think. Or they go their own routes. And that's what's going to happen. Go your own routes. And, but, you, know, you win we'll the world title. We win the world title. Yeah, yeah. Five years on the line, the fight never happens. But... Yeah, he just but he because of the because of the way they're marketing him and because of the, the potential of what he has to be very you know, for a longer time because he's younger, he'll just go his own route, and 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 it's a I think it's a for Dalton Smith's potential will you know championship material potentially time will tell, but they're gonna try not to interject into the story of Adam Azim, I think. Andy, do you think live on the zone? Are, are, are we dreaming to expect uh, Azim Eubank, Azim Smith? Do you think that we'll get those before? And it seems, uh, as Barry just mentioned there, it seems as now, you know, everybody wants it to be not only for just one world title, it's let's both go and win a world title and then unify. Um, but, you know, there have been calls and obviously Adam Azim spoke about it this past weekend. Dalton Smith's been very vocal recently about wanting that fight. We'd all like to see any of them. But do you think that it's realistic? Do you think that we, we get those fights without a world title? I do think it's possible. The the fight with Paulson will happen in February because they need to do it before Ramadan. So that's good. You know, they, they it's going to happen quick. So that keeps things moving nicely. I would expect him to beat Paulson. I think Paulson will have more of a go than Pettijon. I think he'll he'll be more aggressive. So I think that that could make for a better spectacle. But I'd be very surprised if Azim didn't beat him. When you look at the McGuigans and the way they move careers, for them it's about what is the next best step for him in terms of his development? It's not about rushing someone to a world title fight. I, I don't think it is with them anyway, because he's, he's 21. And he's talking about Tiafimo Lopez and Javante Davis and Ryan Garcia. And I love that. But at the same time, they're not going to risk undoing all this work they've done with him by throwing him in too deep, too quick. Um, they just, why would you do that? Why would you do that? I think Eubank is a great fight for him because I think it's it's easier to do because of his um, promotional situation. I think it makes it easier to do him being with Wasserman rather than Dalton being with um, Matroom. Uh, and, and it looked like he might be coming over to Boxer at one point and then it didn't happen. I don't think there's necessarily any problem with that. It was just it was just a business decision. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm a Eubank fan as a fighter I we think know. he's a really good solid no but, but <laughs> no. I think he's a really good solid fighter and he I remember seeing him on the undercard of Linus Adofia Denzel Bentley and he took out Sean Dodd who who w w was past his best days mm. but it was still a really good win good left and hook. That, yeah really mm. good win and at that point he should really have got a fight for the British title because Sam Maxwell vacated Dalton then ended up boxing, I think, Sam Amazon, wasn't it, for a vacant title? And I remember Harlem at that point thinking, how am I not being slid in here? And, and, I, and I totally understood it. So I, I think that would be a terrific fight. And, and you could, God, you could sell that, yeah. couldn't you? You really could sell that. English, and, and, and English back in the in the fold as well. Haven't yeah, we? yeah, you really, you really could, and I, I feel like that would be a great. Like if you're in the Azim business and they're super confident, um, and they will feel that he can beat Harlem Eubank. I think they would look at that, or maybe should look at that, and think, yeah, that will be a big fight week. He'll be headlining again, a bigger fight week than Pettijon. Great experience, good opponent, but one he needs to be able to beat if he is what we think he is. I don't see why you wouldn't do that. Okay, um, we're going to move on. We're not going to ask what comes next for Tyler Denny because I have a feeling that a certain Nathan Heaney, the new British middleweight champion, might pop up in conversation for that. Andy, going to come to you. Um, you mentioned there briefly, as, as did Barry, about kind of there's this whole thing of, of recent years, I suppose, of like, oh, he's British level. Oh, you know, he's no, he's no better than British level. And it's kind of said with this poo-poo bullshit attitude. And then you see Nathan Heaney. Yeah, like, like winning a British title is an easy yeah, exactly. thing to do. But I mean, it's absurd. Isn't when it? you look at Nathan Heaney, and who had boxed for however long, 15 years or whatever it was, and then, then had his break, come back, everything that's gone with him. He's just a ticket seller. He's this, he's not going to be past this, that or the other. That's what it's all about, isn't it, this past weekend. Nathan Heaney, 
I, I said this to Nathan Heaney the day after the fight. I never thought you would win, mate. Like, uh, I, 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 I really didn't. On, on paper, I, like you, felt that Denzel Bentley was was by far and away the, the better fighter. got no problem saying that. I don't know anybody who picked Nathan Heaney to beat Denzel Bentley this past weekend, but beat him he did, and in good fashion as well. He did, and I, but I think that right there was, was Denzel's problem because I don't think he thought that Nathan Heaney... Nathan Heaney could beat him either and and we, we've talked about this kind of scenario quite quite a few times um, Fury and Garnu being the most kind of recent example of it if you don't have that that edge of fear that you could lose then potentially you've got a problem um, and it's very difficult to switch kind of mentality and mindset if the other guy starts well and the momentum starts to move against you it can be very 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 difficult and it's not like he didn't land anything Denzel either because he did mm. he did he, he landed enough shots that he probably thought would have taken him out and they didn't and yeah it didn't you know it didn't go his way and Heaney he, he did the business and, and, and it's just yeah, it's it is it's a really really good story. I didn't think he would he he would win the fight, um, but now that he has, you know, they're both Queensbury fighters, so they couldn't really lose. But I think that Denzel would have moved on from that title soon enough anyway. But well, maybe he'd have hung around for the fight with Hamza Shiraz. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it, it, as we've just been saying, you know, it, it, it is what it's, it's what the sport's about. Like, you know, it's an underdog sport in every possible way. Boxing, every single fighter, the the, the kind of backgrounds that they're they're all generally from, it's an underdog sport. Um, and in sport, you love an upset. You love an upset. It's not great for the favourite. It's not great for Denzel Bentley. But you know, for people watching, it is great. Barry, um, I put a tweet out so it's worse the effect of if Denzel Bentley thought this was going to be essentially as easy as we or the vast majority of people expected it to be going in the ring and only Denzel Bentley will know whether or not that's the case or not but going into the ring how difficult is it to change that mentality when Nathan Heaney's three rounds up after three after three the Stoke fans are shouting and screaming and they're up and down and and Denzel Bentley's landing the shots and he's not going anywhere. What goes through a fighter's mind at that point? I've never been there, mate. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> um, well, we found out he couldn't do it, could he? I think he, tried, he thought, like, like as we all thought, that he'd just be able to walk at some point, walk Heaney down. And, and you know, Heaney was, was always going to be moving, change direction. Didn't think he'd be that effective. Heaney's got massive long reach. I think that that's all. He, he, he's <laughs> you watch Heaney, he looks beatable. He does, even when he boxes well and wins, he looks beatable. He looks vulnerable when he fights. That's just the way. I think that's the. That's what makes him quite exciting. He was like, "Ooh, took a good shot. Oh, we just missed that shot there." But maybe that's his skill set. Just rides the shot. Just takes the sting out of the punch. Can can hold the shot, but it looks like he can't. But he can. But um, he has those long arms, and I think yeah, and he fires in in flurry, and, and not loads on him, but they just they they're stopping you from working. Well, and then while he does that, he just change direction all the time, and it's, sometimes it's true because he ducks over the front foot a little bit and, and dips low, but he's, he's massively effective. And, and Bentley just tried to walk him down, but walk you know just followed him round half the time, walked in straight lines, didn't throw enough punches. I just thought, oh, like if I hit him with the right hand, like we're, we're saying, we're just saying what you said pretty much, hit him with the right hand, I'll be able to stop him in his tracks and then beat him up, and he couldn't do it. And then he got to a point there, he just he, he just couldn't, he just came, he doubled down on his tactics. But didn't there was no urgency in his, there wasn't enough urgency in his work he wasn't willing enough to take a risk and maybe Haney you know there was enough pop in his punches for him not to want to do that I thought Haney was a clear winner me I, I, I think you know I was, didn't totally dominate anything but I thought there, there was no argument to win that fight I, I think if you if you didn't get that I think there was a brawl in my mind I think I thought you I thought you got what three maybe four rounds up I, I, I thought you boxed really well and again, so you didn't. He never looked like he was going to get the British level, and he never. I just thought it was because it was, even the other fighters around him, not going to beat any of those. And Bentley was one of those. He's not going to beat any of those. He, he, he'll fall short. And I still feel that about him. I think the next step for him now, if he box Hamza Sh Shiraz, he's not going to beat Hamza Shiraz. No chance. Or will he? 
I was going to say, we, you know, we, all no, said, we all said the same thing, didn't exactly, we? Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, I, I think, but that's what you have to look at it. You know, and I think, and he did look like a guy who could box. Obviously, he could box. He knew what he was doing. He, and he trains really hard. He's super fit, like every boxer should be. I don't know whether they get credit for that. But, you know, still, he is. He, he, he goes, and he makes sure he's, he's ready. And he fights with his heart and his sleeves. And, 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 he, and he goes out that ring exhausted. He, he gives everything he can give. However, he does it. Yeah, that's something you've got to pile forward like a lunatic to give everything you got. It could be just you throw millions of punches. You're constantly moving. You're trying to box the way you can to win a fight, and he does that. He, he, he all his fans can never be nothing but proud for him. Even, if, even inevitably, at some point when he gets beat up, that's what's going to happen. At some point, he's going to step up too far, like we all do when we get bashed up. They'll be proud of him because you all know he'll just do his very best. You can't argue with that, and that's what makes. That's why you got a good fan base. He put the effort in. But he's one of those. They know what he, they know what he's about. He's a kid who's just going to do his best, never nothing less than his very very best. And Saturday night, his very very best was too good for Daniel Bentley, who might not have been at his best, but that's his fault. That's his problem. If he if he goes in that far, then we talk about how prestigious this British title is. Well, you can't take it for granted then. You, know, you if if you did take it for granted, but I'm not sure he did. I think he, he box, maybe he just boxed. That's the way he boxes, Bentley. It might not have been the same um, acceleration or, or fear in his work, but you know, it got some point in that right in that fight, you got to go. This is not working, and then you got to be able to step. If you, if you're talking about a guy who, who you know give Yanabek a really good fight, so he's more level on paper, then if you haven't got that, I got to dig in deeper, go faster, go harder, then you're not that level. So maybe this is his actual level. He just got beat. So he, he had a lot of questions for himself now, Bentley, because he's a guy who thought he was world level, and it tr- turns out he's domestic level. I'm slagging him off a bit here, but you know, I mean, no, that's fair though. I mean, it's it, you know, it's, on, on the basis, basis of Saturday, yeah, a yeah. it's a grounded yeah. experience, yeah. isn't it? Like all of a sudden you go, I was up here, now I'm thinking yeah. this fight's out of the way, and then I'm looking for world honors. It's, it's, fr- it, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a really high level the British title, and, and like you said, people like to kind of sort of dismiss it sometimes not not that many boxing fans but some not but really it's a really fans. it's a really high level well, it depends and, on your weight that's yeah and, and, and it's fractions isn't it you're talking fractions and if you're just not quite on it on a given night up against somebody who really is and turns out to be a bit better than you thought then you'll get beat and that's that's what happened against Janabek he would have had that fear in him you know and, and he would have thought I'm the underdog here no one expects me to do anything and he would have used all of that so the two situations are completely different, aren't they? They're completely different, but you have to be able to handle both. That's the thing. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we sat down with Denzel Bentley a couple of weeks before the fight and he said, you know, Janabek didn't think I was going to do this, didn't think I was going to do that. Not again saying that he felt that way, but if you're in the position of the champion and you expect somebody to be an easy night's work, as what I sort of said to you, yeah. going in there, and I felt like you could see in Denzel Bentley's face after four or five rounds, him going, oh, shit. This isn't this isn't the way this is supposed to go here. I'm losing the rounds or whatever. I know he said afterwards that he felt that he'd done enough. It was, it was very difficult in the in the heat of the moment. Obviously, he came out afterwards on Twitter and said, you know, well done to Nathan Heaney, mm. congratulations. Which is always always good to see. Um, but you could just sort of see that look on his face of oh no, like I'm so because you mentioned Andy, he hit him with some big shots. It reminded me a little bit of Chris Miller Smith and Lawrence Acoli, where I think people. Said, kind of think that Akoli all he did was hug Chris Billum Smith in that fight. He hit him with some big shots late oh, in that did. fight. Absolutely. And when did. Billum Smith didn't go anywhere and when Heaney didn't go anywhere and like he got hit with a big right hand by Bentley in the tenth round, you just think like sometimes it's just your night. Sometimes yeah. it's your night and you won't be beaten on that night by anybody. No matter yeah. who it is, you're gonna win the fight. And that was just seemingly how it played out. I thought Look, we, we often do, particularly when it's a, a big upset, you always look at what the favourite could have done and was he in the right mental state and blah, 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 blah. But credit where credit's due, I thought Heaney, and I thought the corner work was fantastic. When you consider he's up against it in the eye, not necessarily in the eye of a storm, it's his own storm with all of his Stoke fans, but when you're basically seven rounds up after seven rounds in a British title fight, there was not one second of, of the fight where it looked as though he might give it away. There was never a second where it thought, oh, okay, he's, he's starting to, to deviate from the plan. And whenever he got back to the corner, I thought the advice in the corner was fantastic. Kept him on it and a worthy British champion. And, and I don't think many slash any people could have ever predicted when we saw, first kind of saw Nathan Heaney, with respect to him, he's a British champion, give a shit what I think now, was kind of like the gimmick of, oh, look, he does all of these sides, does Delilah, look, oh, brilliant, but he'll never beat this guy, never beat that guy. He got dropped uh, 
five or six fights ago, didn't he, by, you know, less than stellar opposition. And people sort of looked at it as though, oh, okay, well, you know, this is his own admission, uh, Nathan Heaney said afterwards, that Denzel Bentley thought I was going to be another Kieran Smith. He thought mm. he was going to walk forward, catch you with a shot, put me away, and that'd be it. Mm. If, if that's your mentality and you're against somebody who, you know, his whole life has been building up to this moment, it's very difficult to stem that tide, isn't it? It's yeah. had, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, it can be, it can be. And, and with someone like Heaney, you know, the, a bit like Josh Warrington, I'm not saying that he'll, he'll go on and do what, what, what Josh has done, but their great strength is that they've generated this enormous amount of support, but they're completely realistic mm. when it comes to their own career and what they need to do to get to the next level. And it is just that, can I get to the next level? And then you get there and then you just think, right, I wonder what I might be able to do now. And that's what Heaney will be thinking. He won't, he won't be thinking, well, actually, maybe I'm a lot better than I thought and I can become a, a multi-weight world champion. It's, it's, they're, they're good to deal with. And that's, that's another thing that will make them really attractive to promoters, not just the fact that they shift loads of tickets. It's that they understand what this is all about. And it wouldn't have been the case with someone like him where you would sign him and you get this guy who's deluded and because he sells a lot of tickets feels like he should be getting paid this and he should be getting that fight and he should be on pay-per-view. You're getting someone who who understands the work that is required, who understands he may or may not get to where he wants to get to, but he'll do everything he can to try and make it happen. Frank Warren was the biggest winner Saturday night. Like, yeah. um, unbelievable. Like, uh, like just win, like, not just win. It's just, people think, oh, Warren's on his way out, or this, or all the time. Like, like, unbelievable. Like, and that, like, he's just stronger in the in boxing now than he ever, than he had, arguably, than he ever has been, mm. to be honest, at the minute. And that, on Saturday night, he had all the results went in his favour, including that one. Now, Bentley might be the fighter who, who he thought had better ability to box at a higher level. Be one of the guy who can sell out yeah, uh, arena to win, don't you? Yeah. And and win and win in impressive fashion as well. So he's got on this result, and then we go for the bill as well in a minute, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And all the fight, no, they did. They all just showed up for him. Everyone did, even even the estimate fight. You know, I know Scaff is 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 not Warren's fighter. No, probably is now. <laughs> but, you know, but that's how the deal yeah, works, you know. And Scaff yeah, probably yeah. wants that opportunity. But I mean, you know, but Esselman was you no, know, it was a good fighter. But not the most sellable commodity, so he doesn't. Warren, on a, on a business sense, and this is cruel as it's on, doesn't lose there. If anything, I probably got a fight who, who might be more exciting fights. I don't know. Either way, uh, win or lose, it's not huge damage. It, 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 win or lose, yeah, yeah. yes, it's not. No, it's not like with yes. respect. Yeah, but but he's had he's had he's had a fantastic night's work. I think he did, and then, yeah, and but to be honest, he, he put on a, such a he put on a, he put on a great bill like that. He deserved the rewards. Frank Absolutely. Warren, well done, mate. He gave you over the moon with that now. You have, to, you have to Google who I am first. He used to box you, remember? <laughs> uh, before we move on, I'm going to come to you first because both myself and Andy are very much sold on um, on, on where we stand next for Nathan Heaney. Uh, is it European title? Do you think he said after the fight, look, Frank said the winner of this fight would box for a world title next year. Look, nobody expected him to get anywhere near where he's got to now. Do you just throw him in? Do you just try and do that big night? Get him a shot at the world title? Is that, I mean, for me, I mean, while I definitely want to see the title at any fight, you couldn't argue with that, could you? You, you, you could make a case for, for putting him in there, or would you try and kind of now reevaluate where you are with Nathan Heaney? You can't make a case for putting him in a world title shot. Not necessarily from a competitive standpoint, but no, it's just you great. wouldn't have, put, you wouldn't so, have made the Bentley it, fight from a competitive standpoint beforehand. No, you, really, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, of course. And I think you, know, you didn't deserve it. I mean, we can we also just say we didn't deserve our shots, but I mean it's true. You know, we thought about we're also talking about the the, the the good of the sport, just promote the sport. Chucking Heaney in a world title fight is is just is a ludicrous step. You know, they'll they'll sell out somewhere, and you might never fight again. I, I mean, let's be realistic. But Tyler Denny's a winnable fight for him. So there's the fight. Big fight in the Midlands as Never well. Never happened, of course. It was well there, but of course it's brilliant. It's brilliant I don't fight. know, you know. I think I think the you know, the the the, the Buatzi yard. Yeah, uh, Buatzi has to beat Dan Aziz <laughs> first. I, I understand that, but the winner of Buatzi Aziz versus Yard, quite a lot of conversations have been had about that. From what I understand, that people expect that that will happen. He was, on, he was in the sky with us, wasn't he, the other week? Queensbury and Boxer have been doing bits together yeah. and like the, the line of communication, I think, is better than it is on certain other yeah. sections of the sport. And as we said, you know, Hamza Shiraz was, was, is supposed to be fighting the winner, but I don't know, you know, uh, 
a kind of unification, a, a European title and British title unification, can that override something else? Would the board think, okay, well, this is a great fight and we should let it happen? And I think if you've now got, if you're, if you're Frank Warren, if you've now got Nathan Heaney as the British champion, it's, yeah, it's quite you, different. You don't, you, you, and, and also, you, like, you, you put Heaney in with Sh- Shiraz. And you make Shiraz a huge favourite. Yeah, and, and does that elevate Hamza Shiraz really yeah. past the point? I mean, I don't necessarily it, think it, so. It puts, him in a, it puts him in an exciting fight because the way Heaney fights the high energy makes it an exciting fight. And it's the atmosphere would be fantastic because Nathan Heaney's boxing. So it brings more attention to Shiraz. The problem is Shiraz's next fight then, it's not in a packed out stadium. No. Or, or does he sell tickets? Actually, I, don't, I genuinely don't know. You, he does pretty well on the yeah. tickets, I think. But yeah. you know, but not, it's not Heaney level. Yeah, so you, no, yeah. but, but maybe maybe people see that and they go, "Oh, I'll go and watch him," because if he does a really good job, which is potentially what could happen. But I, you know, D- um, Heaney and, and Denny, great atmosphere. You got to fancy uh, Heaney. It's a winnable fight for Heaney. Though Denny could beat him as well, I think. But it was, it's a great fight, great story. Two guys you wouldn't put anywhere near where they're at, boxing each other. Like, it's like yeah, for a lot, for a know, lot on the yeah. line as yeah, exactly. well. Exactly, yeah. and I feel like like Denny does pretty well with the tickets. He mm. did about a thousand, maybe more, and or, or maybe that was his allocation, and he could have sold more. But for a, for a fight like this, I feel like you're going to sell more than you've ever sold before. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, Resorts World, like the old NEC, Birmingham, I think that's, I don't know what the capacity is. I think it's like maybe eight or nine or something like that. You could do that. Yeah, yeah. You could if, yeah. that. If he's selling a thousand tickets off, off his own back, that's a lot. That's, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah. That's unbelievable. He's a huge ticket seller. Off your own yeah. back, by the way, that's, that's who knows a thousand people? Now, that's amazing. Like, mm. I mean, it's not filling arenas up, but I mean that, that you've got a thousand people bought a ticket there. That means another thousand are going to come anyway because you've got because the, the word of mouth from them people. I'm going there Saturday. Oh, was that? Oh, it's a brilliant fight. To watch this, and it, it, it works like that way. And that's how, that's how it grows quickly. That's how wanted to grow quickly. And other fires, it grows super quick. So yeah. But he's yeah, got, yeah. got a football club, haven't he, behind him? That's that's the and and they've got two broadcasters behind them got Sky and TNT so wherever yeah. that goes it yeah. gets pushed yeah. out across the football gets pushed out on Sky Sports News or wherever it goes you know that yeah. that can really build into no they it. absolutely I mean, I'm, one I'm of those kind of, fights yeah, where something is, happens yeah it's something happens you just don't know I mean it's I'm, I'm, I'm hmm. aware that it's kind yes, of wishful actually, thinking it'd be a scrappy fight but I think it'd be quite entertaining yeah I know, I know that it could be wishful thinking on my part because I, and I'm aware of the potential problems you know I'm not an idiot but at the same time you have to try and you have to try, where we are at the minute this is these are the kinds of things that that we have to try and do that people have to try and do i think and obviously the argument would be whose show would it be um and you know we're not we're not fans of rematch clauses here but it, it maybe it would be the kind of thing where they'd look at it and think maybe they could do it twice and the part of the country that it's in you know both Stables have got fighters they could stick on there, like Fraser Clark's kind of a local guy. You could stick him on. Liam Davis is just down the road. He's a European champion. Get him another European title defence, stick it on the same card, and you've got a really big show because he sells a load of tickets as well. They could say this is like... You would say, because he needs a ticket seller Ben Whitaker, he's, he's, you know, there's there's loads of them. You go, you go on. TNT have this one. We'll have the next one of that level not the same not a rematch but that level so then so then she has boxes if if Denny wins she has boxes Denny on Sky or, or something like that yeah or, or it goes on Sky and if, if Denny if Denny if Denny wins he's got a box she has on TNT or something if they work that way I don't know you should know you're working with everyone haven't you you're like the bridge, <laughs> you're like the bridge the, from you're like the bridge from, um, from boxer to but, well, well, the, the, but the thing is that, yeah. you know we, we, we don't want to get sneaky bridge we don't, we don't, <laughs> want, to, we don't, we don't want to get into any kind of you know promoter wars or, or, you definitely or whatever do, but you're but, saying we know isn't but like at, we? The, at the same time it it you know, if two kind of big houses could find a way to work together, even semi regularly, they could steal a big march on everybody else. Absolutely, absolutely. What happened though? Not a million years. No, but well, look, nah. we, we we live in hope. It's the hope that kills you as a boxing fan. Yeah, exactly. We yeah, we can handle the despair. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. the it's the hope that kills maybe, you. Maybe Turkey. We'll put it. We can see uh, Tyler Denny versus Nathan Heaney, Riyadh season twenty twenty four. Anybody? But that is a worry. Hey. Though. That's a worry. That won't happen now. But that's a worry there. That you yeah. know, then all and I'm sure stadium fights no longer exist, and I don't care about that. But I mean, 
big events won't happen here because the money's somewhere else. And then you know, the, the, the boxing fan who can't afford to fly around the world on a regular basis never get to watch a fight. And then if you can't get, you can experience watching a fight live, you might stop watching it at home. I, t I tell you one thing that was really interesting about that card that got, I know, I know I'm, I'm ruining your structure of the pod here, but <laughs> Ellis Oro getting an opportunity, for example, against Jay Opatia, massive, massive money. How could he possibly say no? Um, and Lyndon Arthur ratings. getting a fight against Dimitri Bivol. I saw Shakan Pitters um, on Saturday. I had a quick chat with him after after the fights. And I said, well, what, what's next for you? And he said, well, I was supposed to be fighting Lyndon Arthur. That was a plan, but obviously he's doing what he's doing. No hard feelings, who wouldn't? But it, it can kind of, it, it already has sort of impacted on that, that sort of level, people getting an unexpected call, which they cannot say no to. Ellis Zorro boxing up a tire. Yeah, that's a oh, really, that, really, it? really, yeah. really hard fight for Ellis Zorro. But we're going to come on to that. We'll talk about that on, on another time. So we do still have plenty uh, to get through. Um, but I mean, we, we've spoken about it on the pod uh, several times. You know, somebody will come along in three, four years' time with more money that will distort it even further. And somebody yeah, will or go, they might I'm waiting for that money, or, or I'm waiting for this money. Yeah. There'll always be somebody to kind of yeah. tempt you over here, which yeah. is I mean, a good thing, keeps things going. But anyway, um, elsewhere on Saturday night, we're not going to have time to run through the whole Magnificent Seven card, and it was a Magnificent Seven card. Um, Nick Ball versus Isaac Dogbay. On paper, I felt would be a really, really close fight and a tough examination of Nick Ball's world title credentials. I think it was some of that, but what we saw from Nick Ball was a fantastic performance against a very able, experienced, world-level operator, Andy. Yeah, it's good good matchmaking. Good matchmaking. And he looks like he is kind of the real thing, doesn't he, really, Nick Ball? There are definite possibilities there. I hadn't seen that much of him live until I saw him at Wembley on the Fury White undercard Isaac when he Lowe. beat Isaac Lowe. And I just remember that the way he did it kind of made an impression on me because Isaac Lowe disappeared through the ropes. He turned his back to him. He definitely felt like boxing wasn't going to continue at that point. And Nick Ball somehow found a way to hit him with a legal punch. And it was a legal punch because even though his back was to him, he managed to step to the side and kind of come round the corner and hit him with a left hand. And that just showed me, like, here is someone who will find a way to hit you um, when it seems borderline impossible to do it. And I was just quite impressed by the, by, by the fact that he, that he took him out in that fashion. Um, it was ruthless, but there was nothing wrong with it. Um, so I've been a bit of a fan ever since I saw that, because not everybody would have done that. Most people would have just thought, well, his back's to me. The rest going to jump in any second. Can't really hit him from here but he somehow found a way to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was it was good matchmaking. It was a, it, it, it was a good performance. Barry, uh, impressed with Nick Ball this past weekend? Yeah, I thought it was good. I think I, think, I thought it was good matchmaking. It was a step up for him, but Doug Bay's not the fight that he was, I don't mm. think. This is not a criticism. I think it was just- No, that's it, fair. It was, it was perfect matchmaking. Doug Bay's tough and he, he is. <laughs> It's that teak tough use against Africans, but it's, it, it's so it's so he so deserves that tag. You know, but he's not the same energy energy that he had his previous year as a super bantamweight mm. when he won the world title. But he's only by really good guys, and Ball was fantastic. I mean, you look at Ball and you think, ah, he got five six rounds of boxing like that, then he'd be he'd be spent. <laughs> but he's not. Picks his shots well. You no, know, he looks like he's just like really aggressive. He's going to walk in the punches. But he, he picks his shots really well. He, you know, again, he takes that real fast step and moves on the target to find find an angle to fire back as well. So he's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got a decent defence when he's not punching, but when he is being aggressive, he is hittable, very hittable. And he got hurt a few times, but he has that natural instinct to fire back or hold on. He knows what to do when he's hurt. Doesn't panic, and that's a, a going up the levels which he is not where he's at now. He's world level, isn't he? Mandatory challenger, yeah. Yeah, so you know it's that's that he'll need that because he will get hurt, and not panicking is 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 the bigger worry than actually not being able to control your legs. It's, I think there's no sense really. It, that's not right. But panic, the panic will get you in trouble. Yeah, panic will get you in trouble. So anyway, he boxed really well, and 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 yeah, it was a it, you know to be a physically tough fight, but really quite an easy night to work for him if that makes any sense yeah you want it you want it clear on the cards but there were moments of life from Isaac Dogbay he caught him with a good left hook at the end of the second round he caught him with a very good left hook 
in the 10th. And there was a few moments where Nick Ball, as he does, kind of leapt in and just, there was a couple of occasions where the right hand was very, very close. One earlier on in the fight where they, they looked as though it could have been called as a knockdown. Um, but yeah, things for him to, to sharpen up on as he moves up the levels, Barry. Yeah, there's loads of it work to, to do with him, but you know, he's, he's there now, isn't he? So, you know, I, I, th I think what he does is good enough you know, to be, he's, he's sort of as good as he can be. There's little, little bits he can do better. But, um, and that maybe just, you know, when you're going forward, being more aware of what's coming back. But it's just, it's just who he fights now for the world title. I'm, so, not, I'm not quite sure. Is Vargas still around? Or is yeah, he so, super middleweight now? So, yeah. <laughs> so it's Ray Vargas versus Brandon Figueroa for the WBC title. Either one of those. Both of cool. those. I put a tweet out about this. They're both stylistically, for very different reasons, because they're both giants, but they both fight completely different. Both very, very difficult fights for Nick Ball. You've got Ray Vargas, who's five foot 14, and he keeps the distance yeah. and controls the range. You've got Brandon Figueroa, who's another guy who's five nine, five ten, but is a is a destroyer on the front foot, smother a swarmer. So both very, very dif difficult fights for different reasons for Nick Ball. Fag Figueroa is a better fight, I think, for Ball. It's a hard fight because he's because he's more hittable. I think that that jab of Ball is fantastic because he really steps in with it. Well, what he does really well, Ball, is his hands and his feet move together. So every time he does jab, you know, he steps in with it. He, he commits to his, his feet are fast as well. So and he, and he has good technique. So he makes before he does anything else, he makes sure that jab hits you solid, and then he then he goes to work after that. So it's like if he throws a one two three combination it's actually a two punch combination you go jab then you go boom boom then he mm. slows he, so he makes that jab singular before he throws the combination off it rather than the rest of us would sort of go bam 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 he goes bam 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 and it works for him because then he, he he doesn't lose any weight in the shot and i don't think he's a do yet he can knock you out cold i think he's a heavy beat you up puncher which is hard to, hard to fight against because you know every shot you're going to hit you is going to hurt every shot hits for 12 you rounds pushes well. you up pushes yeah. you back pushes you off balance yeah the only worry with him is, is he's a hittable target coming forward because someone like Vargas who has fast feet might be able to step back and whip it up because through the middle but you know he, he's, it's a, they're all winnable fights for ball I think yeah I think he's I think he's good I wasn't quite I wasn't sure on him I just thought he's going to some, something about him when he steps up that being so bullish and so short for the weight that and he is small that's why he'd be small I thought he's going to come unstuck but I'm not quite sure now I think that fight there that showed us a lot because he, he, he was up against a guy who can take a shot kept coming at him kept firing back and he and he didn't bother ball he didn't feel sorry for himself he didn't think oh, why ain't I knock it? why ain't he falling apart even when he took a good he took shots late in the, in the fight as well got hurt a little bit and still carried on I think his energy his energy his, his, his mental aptitude towards a, oh, 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 he plans a fight out is fantastic for his, for his skill set so he, he, he knows what he is and he boxes accordingly towards that and I, and I like that he doesn't try and be doesn't try to do too flash or try and be too gung-ho in many areas he does what I, oh, what I this is what I do I'm right direct on the middle I'm coming right at you here but it's, it's when I do it my timing's good and I'm, and I'm direct with my approach and, and it works for him yeah and he, he dips over and throws an epic through, through the middle it's not, it's not all simple you no, know, right in front of your face but yeah it's, but it's the weight of the shot that gets you he knocks you off balance and goes to work brilliant I like him he's, got, he's, he's the next um, Paul Hodgson it was, was the last WBC featherweight champion for Liverpool so there you go Wake Andy up. do you like that fight uh, which one of those fights do you like for Nick Ball do you like Ray Vargas or Brandon Figueroa I, I kind of I think Vargas. I think I would probably prefer to see him in against Vargas, but because I think I think he would be able to get inside that reach, and I think once he got there, he'd be able to really cause him big, big problems. I'd give him a decent chance in either one of them. Were he not to win, I don't think it would affect him, especially. I think, as Barry said, mentally, he seems to have a good, balanced makeup in that he is aggressive. He is he is fairly. Uh, gung ho at times, but but as he said, he does know what he is. He does know what his most effective method is, and at some point you'll you'll come up against somebody who's able to ha to handle that. But that's going to take a very good performance from somebody to be able to handle him if he's right on the top of his game. So I think there's a lot of possibilities with him, and those are two tough fights, and they're two you know they'd be really good fights to watch. I think as well. 
Yeah, I think the Ray Vargas fight for me is a very interesting style matchup. Yeah. But the Figueroa fight would be a total war. It would. It would be an absolute war from start to finish. Um, so both of those fights do it for me. I, I like both of those fights. They're very, very good fights. Um, final quick one from the Magnificent Seven card. We, we referenced it earlier on. Um, Harry Scarf with a brilliant win over Echo Esserman on away territory for the time being. Um, w- with a brilliant win. Barry, there wasn't... I don't know. Harry Scarf is obviously somebody who's come up short a couple of times in the past. Echo Esserman, sort of like not in the same way as as Bentley and Heaney. Of course not, because I think it was it was a much closer fight than that was beforehand. But Esserman was somebody who's well ranked with the governing body, somebody who'd been talked about potentially boxing for a world title. What happened on Saturday night, apart from the fact that I mean, Harry Scarf produced probably the the performance of his career? He did. He really matches energy, didn't he? Mm. That, that's why I think, what, well, Esselman, the engine, I think he's, you know, that's that's what he dines out on and understandably, that he's just going to be busier than you and you just can't live with him. But Scarf not only lived with him, he, he overproduced, I think, or outproduced, I should say, um, Esselman. He was brilliant. And he, every time Esselman went in the fire, he just fired back with him all the time. And because he's longer as well and he kept, move, and he kept moving his feet all the time, it was a brilliant performance. Really was, and the corner were good because they just kept geeing him up all the time. Kept saying you're behind, you're behind, yeah, you're behind. Yeah, just kept geeing him up, and maybe some. You know when you're fighting, isn't it? You just got you knowing him all the time, and just not not allowing him just to 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 just to take his foot off the gas. You have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing it. There's a risk with that, but if you know if you're watching the guy train, you know how he's training, you know what he got in his locker. Then if that's if he has it there, then you keep getting him out because you because he couldn't he couldn't allow if he low decimal to get a foothold if he low decimal to get some more momentum, then then he's hard to deter. But if you're matching him and outdoing him at times and you don't allow him that that foothold, then that takes confidence from Esmond. You could send you could sort of see it, and Scarf just grew every round. He was growing in confidence. He was, it was just, yeah it was a brilliant performance. And again, one of those it's one of those performances when you go oh. No, I knew it'd be. I knew he'd he'd, he'd he'd make it difficult for Esmond, but you thought he would just wouldn't quite have it. But every now and again, a fight gets over the line, and it's not always the first time, second time, or third time. You know, you sometimes you have to just keep persevering, persevering, and he did. It was a good result for him. We got to that sort of stage of the fight where they were talking about, you know, these are the Echo Esmond rounds, ten, eleven, and twelve, <laughs> and Harry Scarf went with him and 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 finished strong. Um, we're going to move on and talk about this weekend. We've got about half an hour, 40 minutes Can left. I should say Liam Davis was fantastic, by the way. I've got to say that. He boxed really well. That was a really good fight as well. Really entertaining yeah. fight. Really strange tactics from Vincenzo Lefamina uh, to kind of wander into yeah. to range of his hands down, but yeah. still well, made for a really good watch. It is. And, and Davis is, you know, I'm not sure well he takes a shot. That was the worry. That's a worry for him. But when he boxes long, keeps it long, he's, he's a real problem. Yeah, a few fights that we're not going to have time to, yeah. to cover today, um, but we will we will touch back on a few things before we finish. Um, going into this weekend, going to come to you first, Andy, for the rematch. Chantel Cameron versus Katie Taylor 2. Going to throw it out there straight off the bat. Uh, repeat or revenge this weekend? I expect to see a repeat. I struggle to see how it won't be unless Cameron has an off night and Taylor manages to drag an absolutely huge performance out of herself, which you can't you can't rule that out because she will be absolutely determined to do that. But in the first fight, I thought Cameron won that fight pretty comfortably. I think we all felt that. And going in, I think we all picked her, didn't we? Because mm. we all felt that she was good enough to make the size difference count. And that's, that's what happened. Um, I think maybe Katie has kind of lost a step because she's had she's had a very long career when you consider she was boxing at the very top level as an amateur for so long and mentally as well the the pressure that's been on her for forever really is is absolutely intense you know you you don't really understand it I don't think unless you um unless you kind of followed her through the amateurs and just realized what a massive star she's been in Ireland for a really really long time so I do feel like she's going down the other side of the hill, which is what happens when you get to the age that she's at. If you're a clean athlete, which I 100% believe she is, 
I just think it's too much for I've, I've always thought that super lightweight wasn't a great idea. I understand why they did it because it was a chance to become undisputed in a second weight division and, and there was no way she was not going to take that. But when Chantel Cameron kind of offered the rematch at lightweight and said, how about I come down and we fight for your belts? I felt like that would have been the better option. But she did want to do that because that's who she is, Taylor. You know, she, she wanted to, she believes she can win. Of course she does. Um, but I think it's going to be very difficult for her. Barry, Andy just mentioned there, we all picked Chantel Cameron to win the first fight. Um, I'm what, sure I did. I, I, think, can't, I can't remember. I think you, I'm trying to give yeah. you some credit for once. We, we usually get them all wrong. But anyway, we all definitely got that one right. Um, what does Katie Taylor need to do in the rematch in order to be victorious? Well, she, she can do what she needs to do because she does the same thing all the time. But it works, it's work for her all the time. She has this rhythm to her work. She bounces back in and out. So she... You know, she forces you to throw with her feet and then she steps back and comes back with a three punch combination. Starts you, she starts with the right hand, so right, left, right. And it's worked so well for her. Like early on, she plays chicken because she just, she, she had outweight you and you'll panic first, you'll throw when you, and then she makes you miss and then she starts. That's what works for her. What she had with Chantal the camera is a, is a naturally bigger woman with a good, fast, hard jab. That pushed her back with it. So in the end, then by the time Katie went to, went to do her work, her back was on the rope. So that little bounce back, there was no bounce back. She couldn't. She had nowhere to bounce back to. So when she did that little like faint and then to move back to fire, Cameron just kept it nice and long. She had no. She didn't. She couldn't step back far enough because she was on the rope. And then Cameron just followed through with long straight shots and worked her body well when she got close as well. I think when 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 Taylor got close and tried to work away. Cameron slowed it down for herself and just banged in the body with with heavier shots, and then I just I didn't think it hurt Taylor, but it, it made her think about her tactics then, and also Taylor's she's changed her style because she was she threw more punches earlier in her career, obviously, but now she's slowed down a bit. Maybe that's because of age, or maybe she wants trying to get more weight on her punches, make it more effective, but it doesn't work for that style of the feet, but in and out, so. She, and I know she can't change because in the Pursuit fight, the Dif Delphine Pursuit, the first one where I thought she lost, but she got over the line in, in Madison Square Gardens, that little step back didn't work because Pursuit didn't fall for that feint. She just threw. She took punches, Pursuit, but she just kept throwing punches because she just fights like a maniac. And in the second fight, you thought that Pursuit would have to do, was going to do the same thing again. So Taylor, all Taylor had to do is to step back and pivot. She changed, changed the angle and Pursuit goes right past you. Because she has no, she doesn't have the intelligence to turn her body. And if she does turn her body, that's like so much energy. By round six or seven, presumably would be knackered. But Taylor didn't. She did exactly the same thing. And then won a close fight where she might have lost again, arguably. But she did the same thing again. So it just proved that she's found a system that works for her. Her body can't do anything else. So I can't see how she can change it against Cameron. It's all about if Cameron just doesn't try too hard to stop her, which is what she'll try and do. I think, I think Cameron will think I can stop her this time. I think she has to be cautious with that because then she gets involved in a, in a war of attrition. Though, how many times she can go to the well? Katie Taylor's been there too often. But she's been there. So she knows what it's like in those dark places. The, the Serrano fight was, I thought the Serrano fight was the, her last great fight. I thought she can be in another hard fight like this. That was, that was mm. brutal, really was. And maybe she, she hasn't been in one since. Maybe she can dig deep. We'll find out Saturday. I think Tate, I think Cameron's going to really try and put it on her, and I think it'll be he might he might then be in a closer fight because of that. Because I I'm with Andy. I thought Cameron won more than comfortable. Yeah, same. More than comfortable. It was it was ninety six ninety four on all three cards, wasn't it? Which I felt it was wider too close. now. I yeah, thought I yeah. It, I yeah. Okay. yeah. I think one thing she might. Wider. I think one th thing she might have been. Well, I think she probably she would have been was concerned about going into the first fight. Cameron would be that. If she didn't, could, could she win if she didn't stop her, basically, mm. boxing Katie Taylor in Dublin? And, and it turned out she could. So maybe she won't be quite as worried about that the second time. And, and, and yeah, like Barry said, the danger is that you look a bit too much for the, for, for the stoppage. But if she is more aggressive, I feel like she could maybe, she could maybe get it. Um, it's a really interesting one with Taylor because she's been absolutely amazing for such a long time. Great for the sport. Um, but I do feel like she's at the end now, but I think convincing her to stop will be very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. What does she do? 
What does she do with her, what does she do with her life? That, well, that's 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 the age old problem and question, isn't it? Brian Peters, her manager, is a really experienced guy, and I think he'll probably have known right from the beginning that that where he'll really kind of earn his earn his keep as a as a manager who cares about the fighters under his stewardship is how are you going to get it to stop when the time is right? It's, the, it's, the, it's always a difficulty with any fighter, but particularly when you've achieved what Katie Taylor has achieved, yeah. like when you've reached that great, great status, yeah. that's always a more difficult because that, you know, at, at that point you are very much in control. You are very much the boss. You're the one who calls the shots. Um, so right. it's going to be interesting to see. And all the money's at the end of your career. Yeah. For every fighter, even the great fighters, the bigger money's at the end of your career usually. So yeah, it's a, and she's earning good money and the money's changed, hasn't it? dramatically in yeah, the last yeah. few years so yeah this would be a decent payday for her again decent <laughs> you know, so yeah but it's not the, compared to the men still so, uh, I wouldn't have thought mm. you know the, of her stature so you know, she's not getting 10 million for this fight is she no, that, I don't think no. but she's not oh. so you know she's not so you know it's, it's, she might be, getting, might be even getting seven figures I don't know but either way it's big money fight for her but it's another fight and she, so she wants to kill and also she, what else is she going to do she lives in Massachusetts she doesn't live in Ireland she's not a, like a She's not going to. She's not going to walk into a media job when she retires. She hates the media. Not does, does hate the media. She doesn't like doing the media. Yeah. With respect. No. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I felt like I sort of vividly remember us discussing the first fight, and it was whether or not Chantel Cameron, who was kind of spoken quite openly about sometimes struggling with nerves and things like that, walking out into very much the lion's den, certainly in the female code, Katie Taylor in Dublin. And we all said, you know, she's not going to know how she feels until she's there. Mm. At the top of that ramp with the ole ole going around and, and Katie Taylor waiting for her in the ring or, or however it was at the time. She's done that now and she performed fantastically well. I always felt like it was a fight that Chantel Cameron could win. But she boxed really, really well on the night. You would expect her to be all the more confident going back into it, knowing that she's gone through all of that beforehand. She's gone through, she's handled the, not only the, the fight, but the occasion really, really well. Um, I guess the, the, the kind of the flip side to that is now she feels like she's done it once. She may, I don't know whether or not this is the case or not, may not have that kind of that same angst of what, what's it going to be like when I'm out there? Yeah. Oh, you know, I have to win dominantly because they're not going to give it to me on the cards. Yeah. You know, or, there's or, always a flip You never side. know, do you? Maybe, maybe, or, or conversely, she might look at it and just think, I need to really, I, I need to really, really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the number one. Yeah. I need, I need to, abs I'm going to go out there and I'm going to absolutely boss this. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to put her away. And then I'm going to, going to demand that people recognize me as the best female fighter on the planet. Because we don't talk about her necessarily, but no. why, why don't we? Because well, she's undisputed champion, a super lightweight. And she's beaten the undisputed champion. She hasn't beaten her at lightweight, but she's beaten the undisputed lightweight champion. And, that, and being Katie Taylor in Dublin, does it get any bigger than that? For, it, it doesn't, no, does it? Can't. And she it doesn't. Beat, and she beat Jess McCaskill as yeah. well. The way, the way she beat Jess McCaskill was, and what she's shown in her two biggest fights is discipline. Mm. In a, like she showed loads of discipline in getting McCaskill, which just beat her with the jab really in the movement. That's, McCaskill's poor, I would say. That. I don't think she's like, unbelievably poor. I think for, for, for a woman of her credentials, and then don't forget, she gave Katie Taylor a really hard fight in New York Hall, yeah, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, so you know, but she was like, technically, she's really poor. She's tough, but and and she knew that um, Cameron, and just kept with discipline. Didn't get close to her. Just working with her by the jab, and the same with Taylor. And she pushed the pace all the time, but tried to ma tried to maintain that that arm's length distance. So when she when she threw the jab, she made sure she stepped behind it, didn't step in and then throw the jab. She stepped behind the jab. She kept everything really, really, and I think that's important. Keep the discipline, but trying to do a better job than you did the first time. I think that's going to be a focus. I think they, they, they I, I got a feeling they I think they can get the stoppage. I don't know whether that's available, but I think they'll go for it, and that might be that might be an opening for Katie Taylor. But can take can can Katie Taylor find that second, third, fourth, fifth gear anymore when she needs to? I'm not quite sure. I think she's willing to to go there. But sometimes you go, you, you know, you see fighters, you know, the instinct is to do it. They can it, see it. It's just can't for net. You go in the tool bags, nothing there. We'll see. But I think Cameron wins and wins wider. 
Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Final one before we wrap up today's show. We see the return of David Benavidez this weekend in a very interesting fight against Demetrius Andrade uh, for the WBC's interim super middleweight title. The winner of this fight will be the mandatory challenger for Canelo Alvarez. We'll we'll park the whole mandatory talk for for one minute because we only have about half an hour left. Um, and they're going to come to you first. Really interesting fight. I'm the closer this fight has come, the more intrigued I am by it. Uh, Demetrius Andrade, a two weight world champion, will be facing his first current, former, or future world champion in David Benavidez this weekend. I'm not massively sure what to expect this weekend, which is one of the reasons why I'm so very excited. Andrade is he is an interesting one because I covered a few of his fights um, when uh, obviously he signed with Matchroom when when the new Zone deal came around and he won that title or he had that fight against Walter Corton Court and Dockwood didn't he when he was supposed to fight Billy Joe Saunders and that was October 2018 and this will be including that this will be his seventh fight in in five years and you look at the list of fights he's had. And none of them were really the fights that he's wanted, were they? And he's been constantly shouting people's names and no one's been interested. Even though he has got a, a decent home following and does does sell some tickets when he boxes at home. But nobody wants to fight him. And it's not because... No, no one's scared of anyone at that level. But he's good. You know, he was a good amateur. He's a very good amateur. And everybody knows that he is he's a problem. He's a potential problem. He's a difficult night's work, as we as we like to say, and I think he's definitely a difficult night's work for for Benavides. And I'm, I'm not, I'm absolutely not ruling him out. But the flip side to the the problem for him is is that he's just not actually been in with anyone like Benavides, has he? No. Who has? <laughs> well, I yeah. Agree. Well, I, I I remember covering um, Andre against Jack Colkai. I could just beat you, that's all I just want to say. No, we did that fight together. No, we never. We yeah, were on we about. Did. No, yeah, we did. <laughs> I remember covering him just before he beat Kulkai with, with John I'm Rawlings. I'm pretty sure we did. I'm pretty sure we <laughs> but, did, um, you know. No, no, you were still doing... You were still doing... No, I did Kulkai well, on... I did Kulkai on Box Nation Luton once. versus Oxford or something. I did Kulkai on Box Nation once. I do remember that. But anyway, he's... Um, I think he's, he has to start fast, Andre. I think he has to start really fast. Because you know Benavides is going to finish fast. I I I don't know. I th I think he'll be he'll be win he can win the fight on he can be winning the fight on points. I just can't see how he keeps Benavides away. And Benavides is clever, and we give him credit for. It. We just think God, he just hands high and walks you down, which is what he does really. But he fires that left hook really quick off from that from that close guard. When you throw a shot, he fires that left hook really quick and long. And being a south ball as well, especially where he, Andre he, he likes it. He, he slides low with it. He gets he gets his legs nice, nice and wide to get length on that jab. He gets really low with it, which is the right idea. But I think against, he, but he's not going to have that size advantage that he's had in the other weights now. And certainly against Benavidez, I think Benavidez finds a gap there. And I, I think once you take the jab away from Andre, you're going to struggle. He's going to struggle really bad. So I think he can make it really competitive. I think it'll be a, an intriguing fight up until about round seven. And then I can just see Benavides storming through. You mentioned there about size. Andre, of course, a world champion at 54, a world champion at 60. Yeah. He's now up at 68 and he's not against a, an average size 68 uh, in David Benavides. How pivotal, how important do you think the size difference could be? Well, first of all, Benavides has got to make the weight properly. I think that's for him because he, how can he not be killing himself to make that weight? I, I, he has to be, but I think it's very. I think it's going to be a big difference. Just the length of him as well, not not so much the the weight, physical weight. Though that's going to be a problem. But there's just the length of where he th throws his punches. Yeah, and you think there's a bigger target to hit, and it might be you know being a south boy, you might be able to you know maybe just be able to sl slide through the middle there with that left hand going low, but I. I, I just don't see it. I think Andre can throw combinations, but he doesn't throw them like um, plant. I don't think. I don't think they have the same pop, pop, like you know, the pop, pop, pop. He throws them smooth. I think you've got to be explosive with your punches with with Benavidez, because he, when he covers up, you've got to let your hands go, and then find an escape route. So and, Andre can do that. He's brilliant with his feet. He's, you know, he moves on the target really well. Can be really tricky. 
but I think he'll try and be too smooth with the shots, and there'll be too much there'll be too much of a gap from the first to the last punch, where Andre uh, Benavides will just go. Yeah, this is my time to go, and you're still there. See, what Plant did quite often, early, especially early in the, in the, in the fight, he, he popped his punches pam, pam, really fast, really quick, flurried, but he was always look. But it, it, his viewpoint was, was to move around you as quick as he can. And while he throws in such, you know, few, with acceleration in his punches, you can't fire back so much. Andre won't have that, don't, doesn't punch the same, same rhythm. So I think that makes it an easier night for Benavidez than, than Plant, I think. And we've seen in the past, you know, Andre, even when he boxed Liam Williams, kind of started that fight at a rate of knots, came out and almost yeah. stopped Liam Williams in the first round. But he does, and historically has done, Andy, after four, five, six rounds, he does get a little bit flat-footed, Andre doesn't, he kind of loses that. I think, because he's a southpaw and he's an athletic southpaw, I think slick is a word that gets thrown around. For, I don't think he's particularly slick, Andre. He does rely a lot on the, on the kind of the athleticism to get him out of trouble at, at certain awkward. points. But after six rounds, he does become decidedly less awkward and more of a of a stationary target. I've found. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I think that 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 could partly be due to the opponents he's been in with, and and he's felt like he's winning the fight comfortably, maybe, and just neglected a few things. I've always I've always felt like there's more to come from him, and I've always felt like I wanted to see him in at a higher level. I just feel like it needed to happen sooner than this, and this kind of period he's had in his career where he's been a champion for five years, but just hasn't been able to kick onto that next level. I think that that I think that if that period lasts for too long, then then it has an effect on you. It has an effect on you, and I, I do. I mean, I would pick Benavides because I think the logic dictates that you that you pick Benavides. But I'm kind of pleased for Andre that he's got this opportunity because it's what he's been wanting for a really long time. And circumstances, to an extent, have kind of conspired against him to ensure that it hasn't happened. And it's happening, as we kind of mentioned earlier, above what we, you would expect to be. We never know this weekend. He might show something different, his best weight. But the fact that it is, for me anyway, I mean, there's a lot of wacky stats in boxing, as we know, but to be 32-0, and 0, a two-weight world champion, and to have never boxed a world champion is has to be one of the most staggering statistics in boxing. <laughs> never boxed a former champion, a future mm. champion, or a current champion. <laughs> Kind of indicative of what we were talking about earlier, wasn't it, with regards to sort of moving up through the weights and you know, Andre, the two weight world champion, his best win is Liam Williams. He, he'll he'll have had Jack he, Colquet. I mean, he, even though he's Crazy undefeated, yeah. he's I hope he's made some decent money. But he, he it's been an odd. He did well without his own thing. Didn't yeah, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. He, he did well. It's been an Barrett, odd, frustrating career because he had he had a strange situation. I can't remember the details of it exactly, but. When he, when he was down at Super Welter and he gave the title up and then he, he box didn't Jamal box for, Charlo, wasn't he? He didn't box for ages and there was something going on contractually, I think. And then he came back and he beat Cool Kai and it was all just very, very strange. I think he has made some money, yeah, as you say, because he was one of those original Matt Drew, the Zone USA fighters when they went after that kind of cohort of really big names mm. and they didn't come. And he was one of the, the five or six they, they did sign. Um, but I just think it's—I just think he's found the whole thing politically very frustrating. It's kind of like so. There's a lot on this fight for Andrade. I think. Yeah. When you look at oh, his no, career, this, this is it for him. Yeah. Isn't it? If you look at—if he wins this fight, then he can go back and say, oh, I, "I would have so. I done this. I would have done this. They avoided me." I told you so. He loses yeah. this fight, and then everyone says, "Well, you know, you never well, beat anybody." Yeah. And if he wins, he'll be able to turn around and say, "I told you so." And if he loses, everybody will be able to turn around and say to him, "We told you so." Yeah. yeah. There's it's a lot on this fight really. for him. There's more on it for Benavidez, I think, because he's the guy that's in set, a different way. He, but yeah, 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 yeah. There's a pressure there. This is a this is a real this could be a real stinger of a fight, by the way. The, yeah, on, on Andre. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there's no, always a potential. No, yeah. if he boxes to his strength, then maybe it is. You know what I mean? Trying to frustrate Benavidez, but you no. Know, so Benavidez got to be his. Got to. This is the fight that he's got to look really effective. No, this is this is his. Um, his audition for the Canelo fight. This is this is Canelo's Lara's Lara fight. Mm. Not quite this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, where a fight where you might, you know, you might, you just might get over the line a real boring, it, tricky, awkward fight where he's picked up four, five, five rounds off you, and made it, made it, you know, arguably close. 
it could be one of those and then they go out oh, how are you going to be canelo when you couldn't do that so you know when you couldn't dominate him that's what they're going to say but um even though him is a good fighter so i think it's the pressure's on him to go out there and perform and i expect him to actually i do i, expect him to, I, I think he's going to try and start fast rather than because andre will definitely start fast because they said that's what he does and he, he carried some power in those early mm. rounds as well because he because he's he's a clean puncher but yeah he's very but his energy wanes too quick for benavidez not to be dominant in the final stretch do we want the winner of this fight against canelo alvarez is that what is that what we're lobbying for here on the boxing show who cares yeah <laughs> I, 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 I think like, so yeah, i, I like want to see winner. benavidez against canelo but yeah. let's, let's say Andrew stands him on his head. <laughs> Again, though, I don't. I, I get, he'll deserve his shot. I don't argue with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not, it's not a fight that I would clamour to see because, again, that's going. You no, know, for for Andre to win, he's got to be really elusive and awkward, and 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 that's not a great fight. But Benavidez and and, Can and Canelo, how oh, can that not be a great fight to watch? Yeah, if Benavidez goes through him and steamrolls him in eight or nine rounds. Yeah, him and Canelo there you know Canelo can, you know, Canelo can't avoid him you know, with the size difference and everything else and you know, he only carries power Canelo but Benavidez would want to just bully him and he'll, he'll want to bully him it's a great fight to watch that Mexican pride everything involved about it mm. you know, that's, that's, it's, it's a war it certainly is right we've come to the prediction element of the of the show um, we're, I don't know if we're in good form or not uh, we'll just say we are because people won't go back and check uh, and you're going to come to you first Chantel Cameron versus Katie Taylor too. Cameron points uh, I don't think she'll quite be able to two minute rounds I don't think she'll be able to, to force a stoppage and I don't think she'll necessarily be obsessed with getting it either Barry yeah I think Cameron points Cameron points for me as well. Barry, going to come to you first for David Benavidez versus Demetrius Andrade. I think Benavidez, round 11. Andy? Points, Benavidez. I'm going to go for Benavidez, but I stoppage as well. I'm going to go for 10. So 10 or 11. Um, so, yeah. Expecting a good fight, though. And I do expect, yeah, I think, um, well, I I expect the first three or four rounds to be very interesting, very entertaining. Um, but that is all we have time for today on The Boxing Show. Just before we wrap things up, just like to say a shout out to the former WBA Super Flyweight Champion of the World, Cal Yafai, former Olympian and of course, former world champion, who announced his retirement this past weekend after a first round stoppage loss to Jonathan Rodriguez. Congratulations on a fantastic career, Cal. We wish you all the best in the future. But from us this week, that is all we have time for from Mr. Barry Jones and Mr. Andy Clark. Thanks very much for joining us and we'll catch up with you next time.